Well, good morning, Southside. Special greeting to any visitors. We're grateful to have you come and worship uh, our God together with us. And thank you, Jan and Marty. That was very God-honoring. We've got a lot going on this morning, so I just wanted to start just encouraging you with the the sweet fruit that I've been seeing in Philippians in your life as the saints of God. It's been some intense passages, and I feel like I've been coming at you hard because I love you and I want you conformed to Christ. So I thought I'd just encourage you with how beautiful God's working. The unity of the Spirit has been rich and real. The deepening of the saints has, has been profound. Grumbling is considerably less. More talk about the beauty of Christ, considerably more. Outreach is growing, and I pray we'd excel still more. The harvest is plentiful, and the workers are few. I wanted to give glory and thanks to God for the church planting efforts last week. We heard from West Denver on their one-year anniversary, and the one thing I heard going again and again is the Word of God is being preached. This is a family. It's our community, and we're outreaching into the community in which we live. Praise God. North Africa, 10 years of frontier mission work of a cost that is un, unexplainable how deep it's been. God has sprung up a little church, and he healed up their parents in a beautiful way while they were home this summer. The Spirit is blowing, and we're praying for revival in that region. Tijuana, the fruit is strong right now. Gospel-centered, Christ-centered, deep love and, and outreach and ministry to the orphans. And I just bring this up because so many of you have sacrificially given to them to be able to go do this and you've prayed and you've counseled and you loved and you accommodated them while they're home. This is koinonia and the gospel together that Paul's been talking about in Philippians. So a lot of time is being put toward church planting and revitalization and I'll give you more updates as we journey. The unity among the elders and deacons is strong and blessed of God. We have our elder retreat with our wives coming up starting October 31st, Reformation Day. Um, Pray for that time if you would. And lastly, this is my last Sunday preaching before going on vacation. Um, I I loaded you up with great preachers. So I want you to, to just hear one thing. We're a church. We're the ecclesia. We grow by gathering together to worship our God Uh, on the day that's been assigned by the elders, uh, and we've chosen Sunday, the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. Uh, Hebrews were not to forsake the assembling together as is the habit of some, so it's my vacation, it's not yours. (laughs) So I just want to make sure you you get that, that um, anyone that opens the Word of God, I can eat from any chef. If the meal is the meat of God's Word, I'm, I'm not a spiritual vegetarian. I Give me the meat. And so for the next weeks, month, you're going to be hearing the Word of God opened and taught. So I just encourage you to to gather and let the body cause the growth of the body. Um, Prayer uh, for my dear son. He's 28 years old, and I had to go to his house yesterday, and he was over a, a bucket throwing up blood, just filled up, and it was coming out both ends. Um started passing out, just thought for sure he was going to be with the Lord. And so we had to have an ambulance gurney him and take him to the hospital. And uh, he's no longer in critical condition. He is um, still bleeding, throwing up and vomiting, and they can't figure out yet what's causing it. So just prayer for my dear son and his wife and his little two-year-old and newborn and all the family associated with that. So let me pray for Josh, Danell, and some of the sweet saints. Father, I pray for Jan and Marty. What a testimony. I pray you keep meeting them. You're better than life. You're better than anything this world has to offer. Thank you for manifesting that deep into their hearts. God, I pray you just show Joshua Jesus Let him put his complete hope and trust and confidence. Let him look to you, not to doctors or surgeons. 
Let him look to Jesus Christ and find peace and comfort. Let his sweet bride find great comfort in Christ. God, I pray for Danelle and all that she's going through. Would you meet her and help her and encourage her in these days? And Austin and Claire Lease with some big tests this week. God, would you meet them and would you strengthen them and help them? Just all these other needs, God, we lift them up to you in great confidence because you're our Father, Abba. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. So, one last announcement. Uh, You probably already knew this, but my heart is on fire in Philippians. So to step away from it this morning is rough. We're going to return to it when I get back from vacation and just get ready. I usually come back a little pent up uh, after vacation. So rarely do I ever pull out of a text. If you're visiting, I think this is the fifth time in the history of a 26-year church. We, we pulled out when Columbine happened, 9-11, and twice during COVID. And this morning, I, I want to pull out for my last Sunday. I want to address the upcoming election of the President of the United States and really all the ramifications that go with it. I want to shepherd the flock of God because I find this to be a very intense season, and I want to make sure we don't miss what God has for us in it. So the next Sunday, I'll be back in the pulpit. pulpit. The election will be over. And, and I wanted to shepherd you at such an important season for gospel advance. Gospel advance has been the theme of Philippians. And so I don't want us to miss the opportunity that the Lord is putting at our doorstep. I, I want to come to this the opposite of the world. We, we should look so different than the world, the way they're thinking, talking, and acting. We, we should be peculiar people set apart and different, aliens, sojourners. So I want us to make God, who, who you can't make God more glorious, but you can glorify him and show others how glorious he is. And I want them to look at the way we live in these days, and they would say, man, what a great God that they serve. The, these days have been decreed by him. He's told us ahead of time of how he's going to unwind the world. Nothing's running out of control. The sovereign one is working out his perfect decreed plan. In Philippians, we, we learn that we're to be a, a diamond. We're to be, we, we live in this black velvet called the world. And as bad as the world gets, it just makes the velvet darker and it makes the diamonds shine brighter. And that's the calling for us in these days. So what will a diamond look like in this season? We might have many different answers. Uh, This is what I want to take up this morning. I'm kind of feeling insecure like I should have stayed in Philippians, but uh, let's, let's go to our God and ask him to bless us in our worship this morning. Father, we come before you, and I thank you for a veil that has been torn in two. I thank you that you've opened our eyes to see the radiance of your glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you that we've seen him in such a way that we desire for him to be the Lord of Lord and King of Kings of our life and our heart. God, I pray that you would lead and guide us as the people of God in these days that we find ourselves in. I pray that you would use this morning to strengthen us in our unity and encourage us in the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, um, raise up labors for the harvest. Lord, um, be with us. Be glorified this morning in our time. Amen. So as we look at this upcoming season, I just want to, I like the bird's eye view I always have. What does God want from the people of God? So I just want to begin there, and I want to read with you the last words that Jesus left to us on this earth. In Matthew 28, verse 18 Jesus came up and he spoke to the apostles, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will be with you in this great commission all the way until he returns. Thank you, Jesus. Please, let's not get distracted from that. 
Philippians, the whole thing has been that we have koinonia in the gospel. It unifies us to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and take it to a hurting, dying world and give it to believers, that testimony today. That's what happens when you look at Jesus and the gospel every day, and that we will be shooting for God's glory instead of our own, and that we would be a light. This is why we exist. We're to guard the once for all truth that's been delivered to us by God. We teach it, we preach it, we sow it into every area of life. In fact, if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We looked at this for five years, so if it sounds familiar, I'm glad. (laughs) Romans 1.14 is where I want to begin. Paul says, I'm a debtor. I'm under obligation because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because I was going to kill Christians and God zapped me and showed me his glory and saved me on that road. I'm now a debtor to the Greeks, to the barbarians, to the wise, and to the foolish. This gospel has indebted my heart that now I owe it to everyone who's under the wrath of God to tell them about the saving power of Jesus Christ. And I want you to hear that list. Greeks, barbarians, the wise, and the foolish. That's a picture of our world. And we're to have a heart for them that I am now indebted to tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not to sit up on a high perch and condemn and just uh, hate them, be evil to them, dismiss them. I'm I'm to have a heart That's under obligation to tell them of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I always said when your mission field turns into your enemies in your heart, you've missed it. And so the gospel makes us debtors. And in verse 15, so for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. There wasn't a more barbaric city in the world. I'm eager to come and tell you the gospel because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to bring you into the realm of salvation, to take you out from under the wrath of God and bring you into this safe place of being loved and accepted and cherished by your creator. There's nothing else that can do that. Politics will never do that. Only the gospel can bring men, women, and children to the place of salvation before their God. And in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. And so it's a gospel that God has done all and he gives to you by grace through faith, the open hand that receives Jesus Christ. And so this fallen, broken world is not our enemy to hate, but our mission field to love. I'm a debtor to homosexuals. I'm a debtor to the immoral, to transgenders, to murderers. I'm a debtor. Check your heart this morning. Is that true? Has the gospel done that? I'm not saying do you approve it. It's sin. Are you a debtor? To tell all men, women, and children about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Secondly, as we go out, I want you to hear this. To fulfill the commission that Christ has left for us. The world and the God of this world, the devil will hate us and will try to destroy us, break our unity, poison our message, and get our focus on lesser things. He's against it. He's opposed to it. And we're to enter into it. And as we enter into it, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You're going to be blessed when you hold this truth up and live it, and the world comes at you and hates you. Philippians 1.27 It said it's been granted for you to suffer for Christ's sake. Jesus said, don't return evil for evil, but good. Turn the other cheek when they slap it. Go the extra mile. You've heard it said to love your your friends and hate your enemies, but I say love your enemies. Hebrews, the writer said, gladly, we gladly accepted the seizure of our property because we had a better hope than this life. 
And Paul says, I'm about to be martyred and die by the Roman government for the service of your faith. I think we're getting this wrong in some ways. What I see so often is we retaliate. We fight with the weapons of the world and not with, with the words that are divinely powerful to take down fortresses, strongholds. We're not getting that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but evil forces and demons and the devil. And these bad leaders and people in sinful government will die and they will go to hell. And those who have been affected and believe the lies and the messages will stand before God at the end. These things need to matter. I've said it so many times, we've had this weird season in America where the government early on had so much common grace and even some special grace in the laying of the foundations and constitutions and the Bill of Rights to bless this nation in amazing ways. And my favorite is that we have the ability to worship and open the Word of God without fear for our lives this morning. But it's coming to an end. It, it is changing quicker than I've ever seen it since I've been alive. To name the name of Christ and preach the whole counsel of God unashamedly as we are committed at this church, you're going to be hated. You'll be persecuted. There'll be threats to throw you in jail. In some areas, they come into churches and shoot them up. The world will not love you because it hated Christ. Start living like him, and you'll be blessed to be an outcast and have all kinds of evil said about you. It's a blessing to identify with Christ and be hated and rejected by this world. And our whole lives have been given how to be accepted by it. You come follow Jesus, that's over. Paul said, I wouldn't be a bondservant of Christ if I wanted the approval of men. This is what it means to take up your cross and follow after Christ. So we can't lose our focus on what Christ has called the church to be about. We can't miss the opportunity to show the world love and forbearance when they persecute us and try to harm us. And our response will proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ most loudly. But trashing people and slandering them on social media and calling them stupid is not going to get it done. Truthing in love. Truth in love is the means that God uses in these kind of days. So we've been taught that our rights are sovereign and that they're worth killing for or at least fighting for. And that's not like the lamb that was led to slaughter willfully. He was wronged and he was persecuted and he uttered no threats. He taught us meekness in the midst of hostility and hatred while entrusting his soul to a faithful creator. We're to walk in those footsteps, truthing in love. So what's happening, my third point, if you'll stay in Romans 1 that we just read, what's going on? Is God still in control? And I want you to see that God is absolutely still in control. So after we've just read that we're unashamed of the gospel, we're eager to preach it, uh, look with me in verse 18 of Romans 1. <clears throat> What's happened? Well, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Remember that word? It was like a spring that something's pushing against it and something's pushing down. And he's about to tell us that creation tells us there's a God and our wickedness says, no, there isn't. I don't want anyone telling me how to live. I don't want any morality. I want to be my own God. I want to say how I'm going to live. And that is the wrath of God's going to come because you're saying, I don't want God. I don't want him in my mind. I don't want him in my heart. I don't want his truth. Get it out of here. And let's look at what happens. Because of that, which is known about God is evident. How? What's well, within them? God made it evident to them. Well, how did he do that? Well, since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, I want you to hear this, have been clearly seen. You can't miss it when you look at creation. Being understood through what has been made so that they're without excuse. You look at creation, there's got to be a creator. And you're without excuse to say, uh-uh, I don't want a creator. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him, honor him as God, or give thanks your creator, you deserve thanks for 
all things. But instead, they became futile in their speculations, their guesses about God and life, and their foolish heart was darkened. It's just dark now. There's no light at all from that special light of creation coming in. And now the Greek word pretending to be wise, all their espousing of their great knowledge and great thoughts and great ideas about creation, they've become fools. They literally have become fools to say, you came from a monkey. You might have come from a monkey, but I didn't. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God. And I've always, the Greek is for the image of an image of an image. Instead of God, you've you've started to worship men and animals and stars. The image of the image of an image instead of worshiping God. Therefore, God gave them over. You don't want me? Okay. I give you over. You won't have me to be your God. I give you over. And I'm going to give you over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. I'm going to give you over so that their bodies will be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. How do you serve a creature instead of the creator? That's something's wrong with your mind to to get that off. Who, Who this creator is blessed forever, amen. And for this reason in verse 26, God gave them over to degrading passions. Their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. It's homosexuality. And in the same way, the men abandoned the natural function of the women and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty and their error. God says, I give you over. And this is what's going to permeate your hearts and your society when I give you over. And then he says, and just as they didn't see fit to acknowledge God any longer, it means I don't want God in my mind. I don't want a God. There's not a God. I'm getting rid of him. When they did that, God gave them over then to a depraved mind. You're you're like an animal now. An animal just has no reason. And if you're not going to use your reason that has made you in the image of God to see the creator and to worship him and give him thanks, I'm going to give you over and now you're going to act like animals. And you're just going to burn with lusts and desires and sin. This is what happens when God says, you don't want me? I give you over. And then look what it says they do. The things that are not proper, being filled to the brim is the Greek word, with all unrighteousness and wickedness and greed and evil, full of envy, a murder. Strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to their parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, They not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. They applaud sin, and they encourage it, and they say it's what's right, and it's what's good. That is a day in America. And so I declare that government has failed its God-designed calling in Romans 13 that Sean read this morning. It's to reward good and punish evil. The government has has left its rightful place, in my mind, when it moves into theology. When When it moves into theology instead of rewarding good and punishing evil. When it starts telling us what marriage is and who can be married. When it tells us about abortion, whether murder's right or wrong. Who's a man and who's a woman. 
and all that we're beginning to see them define, that's where the church has to step in. Theology is our calling to stand and preach the truth on these gospel matters because they matter. As a society and the family are breaking down with these issues and it is just broken in our country, we stand on these truths and we proclaim the truth of God's word about marriage and male is male and female is female. We declare these things and abortion is murder anytime it's done. We're to show the world the beauty and the design of God's order. And one of my great joys is watching these families get it right. And they're doing their marriages right in the training of their children. And it's like this is a place of aliens and sojourners when I enter in here on Sundays. And so to God be the glory for what's happening. So I want you to hear this. God is not going to judge America. He already has. These are the fruits of judgment and, and they fill our land. And when he gives a person or a whole nation over, I want you to hear this, the consequences are great. And I want you, one last thought. Broncos Parkway is not Goshen. Do you know what Goshen was? That's where all the plagues happened, except in Israel, and, and there was never any plagues that touched Israel. And sometimes I think we think, oh, all this judgment upon America, we're so blessed, we're in Goshen and nothing's gonna touch us. So what I want to bring to you this morning is believers are not exempt from the consequences of God giving a nation over. You're not exempt from it. You're living in the middle of it, but not of it. And so we are not under the wrath of God. We're under the love and the help of our Father. But we live in a land that has the wrath of God upon it. And the consequences are grave and deep, and they're going to affect each and every one of us. And so all the destruction that comes when you take God out of your mind, out of your society, out of your schools, homes, and churches, absolute sin and anarchy is going to take over when you do that. Sin will run rampant as in Romans 1. So we live in a society that's imploding and it's going to suffer great loss. And in Philippians 3, Paul's going to say, I pray that we could have fellowship in his sufferings. As we stand for Jesus Christ, we can have koinonia with Jesus and suffer with a world that's going to hate you and spit you out and reject you and want to kill you. We can hide, we can dole down our message, or we can fulfill this great commission and know that Christ says, I'll be with you always, and that we can have fellowship in his sufferings. But it's not go out and be obnoxious. It's go out in truth and love. They need the gospel more than ever. I got to preach to 50 DU students on their campus on Tuesday night. I got to walk onto one of the most liberal campuses and preach Philippians 3. And man, did I learn a lot about the campuses. You know what I learned? They're ripe for the harvest. They're sick of what's happening in this country. They don't trust their government. They're, 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 just, they're looking for answers like never before. It's time to enter in. Those who stand and speak against it will be hated and suffer greatly. So I just want you to hear this. The church matters so much that we're to be a beacon of light with the right answer. And I, I, it's got to get where we actually gather together for survival. That couple couldn't have got through what they got through with their kids and grandkids without you. They needed God and they needed a body who loved them and prayed and encouraged and helped them. I bet you don't even care about some of the stuff I'm about to talk about because you're just lost in love, wonder, and praise. And we're going to start coming and I need hope. I need encouragement. I need to come and have my soul lifted. This isn't my true home. I need you guys to help me. And that first comes suffering, and then comes exaltation and glory and reward. It's the whole Bible. First comes suffering. These present uh, trials are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed. We will suffer. It's coming. It's upon us. And we won't fight 
anymore over non-essential doctrines and issues and grumble about music and preaching and aesthetics and children are running around too much. Praise God, there's a bunch of children running around. I just All these things are not going to be what float the boat anymore. You're going to come in and just say, give me Jesus. Help me hope for another week and not cave in to all the pressures that are around me. Praise God, these things are coming upon us. There's some things that are, are, are going to change us. We're going to gather and we're going to need the means of grace to make it another week. Got so many fighting cancer and trials and the cataracts are coming off and they see Jesus and nothing's getting to them. They've suffered so much, they're like, what, what is this? I just see it on a constant basis. We need each other, Southside. The evil days are upon us. If I don't believe the gospel with all my heart, I'm going to be the apostate one. Keep yourselves in the love of Christ. Hard days are coming, and people who are meandering and playing with Jesus are going to walk away. I've never needed the body of Christ more in my life. I need your hope and your trust and your encouragement, your prayers, your exhortations to keep running. I pray that you see this. Fourthly, I got to get moving. Philippians 2, we're to be lights. So how do we do that? We learn not by grumbling, humbly serving others. My self-glory and my selfish ambition have to die because just a little squeezing like COVID, you know what I saw? Flesh. The church looked in many ways like the world, just with better answers. But the same fear, spirit of division, and self-righteousness crept in. Boom. A pampered nation. What will happen when the wrath of God that we just read in Romans 1 is just growing and coming upon the nation? What will it look like to be a light? It means to not lose our purpose. The gospel will be needed in times like this like never before. We're going to need it 24-7 to preach it to ourselves and to preach it to others. So we got to stay united and bonded in this gospel and help each other with it. Stay unified in all the chaos and all the hatred that's beginning to surround us. And we come together, we love our enemies, and we pull in Isaiah 26.3, Thou will keep in perfect peace. The Hebrew is shalom, shalom, him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in thee. And we got to begin, I, this has been my mantra lately, is that Christians are the best at saying, I believe in the sovereignty of God and not trusting him for day-to-day -day things. We, we rename it. I'm a little bit anxious. Oh, I'm a little bit worried. We, we just give different names to unbelief and not trusting God. And what's coming, if we don't trust God, you're in trouble. If I don't trust God, watching my boy laying over a bucket throwing up blood, who is he? Consider the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. Aren't you much more worth God? And so if we start losing our jobs and our houses and our money, there's a God who feeds his children. And we're going to need to be anchored on that sweet quote by Hudson Taylor. How much money do we have, Hudson? 25 cents on all the promises of God. I want a whole church like that. I'm not there. I want every one of us to get there because it's coming. So do I really trust God? We're there. This isn't doom and gloom. Oh, oh I skipped the line. You need to hear it. No one is going to ask about Netflix. We'll gather each night to read our Bibles and pray to just make it. I just, this is what it means to be a Christian. Corey Ten Boone in that Nazi camp said there's no pit so deep that he's not deeper still. We got to know that, believe that, help each other in it. Let us go deep together and build relationships that can help us make it to the end in faith. We're, we're one. And you knew I'm going to mention this, parenting. Oh, parenting. These kids, I was, I don't know why I did it, but during COVID, I remember my application? I preached it, and my application was, have children. <laughs> and I don't even know why. I was just like, don't be afraid. Have children, and, and we've had 25 children born since then. Sorry, guys. Um, 
These kids have to learn how to live by faith and the hope of a city whose builder and maker is God. We got to train them to know what their hope really is, and it's not Denver. You got to train them and point them and teach them and live it. The greatest need is not for you to helicopter them and make sure they never face anything hard or difficult and surely don't make them think that they're not God. Don't ever use the word no followed up with discipline. That's for free. You can tell I'm a little impassioned because you know why? I think I'm soft. And I think many of us in this building are soft. And we need to get a wartime, end time mentality and unify in it and march with the gospel. We're going to have to get tougher in Jesus Christ, stand firm in our faith. So you want to know what helps me? What is the greatest fear in the next year and following? I, I like to flush it out. Like, don't just live like, I always use that illustration of Jaws, dun it, dun it, where you just walk around and you always feel anxious and are waiting for something bad. I want you to look at what is it you're really afraid of? Is it losing your job? It, look at what it is and come to the perfect love of Christ and let it drive out all your fear. So don't just feel anxious. Go to the root. What is it I'm really afraid of? And then bring the Bible, get your answers, and let his love drive out your fears. So during this season, during this time, name what is your greatest fears? What, what's got you? And, and go to Christ with it and let that love drive it out. You with me? Okay. I haven't even mentioned the election yet, have I? Yeah, my fifth point is we're to submit to our governments. Uh, Romans 13, we learned that this is submitting to God. God has established them. He's put them over us. And I, I want to make sure you got a right spirit to God. Um, it's easy to badmouth your leaders, to slander them and to hate them. I'm not saying you agree with their policies or anything at all, but you agree with God that he's put them over you. And when I submit to them, I'm submitting to God. And I want to make sure that we get that before we got a big issue where nobody wants to hear that, okay? It's biblical. It's Romans 13. Next, we're to pray for our leaders. Every month from this pulpit, we pray for our leaders. And then number seven, we live in a country that can vote. It's a gift. I had a professor named Alex Montoya. He, he's planted 50 churches, and I was at his church the last Sunday before I left, and it was, it was election and he said, if you stay home and eat dinner and don't go out and vote, I hope you choke on your tacos. <laughs> it stuck with me, okay? I'm not going to say that. But I don't like when I hear I'm not going to vote because I don't like either candidate. There, there is no one more qualified to vote in an election than a Christian. There, there's nobody who has the mind of Christ to be able to look and see what is best for the country that I live in? We should have the mind of Christ with his word. You are the best people to vote for your leaders. You have light. You can understand right and wrong. You can understand what candidate will represent truth uh, the best for our good. And you need to consider your God-given right to vote and who will lead your country and sacrifice to get to a voting booth or time to fill out a ballot or mail it in. So you know that our hope is not government, it's God. But we uh, live in a country where it's right to say, I care about my country and, and the common graces so we can continue to stand and proclaim the gospel and some of these great freedoms that we have enjoyed. But the, uh, in closing, the one thing I want to make clear is I think that politics have changed greatly in America. And it's not just different thoughts anymore on policies, economics, big government, small government, taxes, the things that have been de debated in this country since it began. That's not it anymore. So I just want to make sure you get it's changed. And when you look at Romans 1, and God gives over a country that won't have him be God, and we looked at what the sins are that come out when he does that. This election, we have two leaders who I would believe are not Christians. 
I've listened uh, a week ago to Donald Trump's testimony, and it's that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. So we have two leaders who are not Christians, so we're, we're not looking for that. And I, I, I wouldn't leave my grandkids to either of them to babysit. Thank you. <laughs> but I would leave you to babysit my children. So, so we have two platforms, and you got to do your homework to discern which platform will, best, will be best for why God designed government, which, which one is fully characterized by Romans 1. One platform is truly like Israel, where they've reversed right and wrong, and they par- parade debauchery, and they exalt it. And God gave that nation over for those sins. They've taken the sins of Romans 1, and it says they'll give hearty approval to those who do them. And it's now all this sin is lifted up as normal, great. I heard, I think it was Oprah Winfrey, who said, we can't have the American dream if, if we don't have abortion. That's the American dream. That should make you want to spit. They've boasted in the beauty of abortion, the mutilation of the body, and changing the sex that God has made you, letting teenagers do it without permission of their parents, the exaltation of homosexuality and immorality. MacArthur said this is the greatest terrorism in America. So we stand united as an elder board that both platforms have sin and sinful leaders, but there's one platform that has become the platform of giving hearty approval to those who sin in this way and are coming at the freedoms that we have as a church. They call good evil and evil good. And I want you to vote your conscience, but it needs to be filled with truth and take time and study it out and be gracious to one another in these days. Look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10. I'm out of time. But in closing, there's something I'd like to share Judgment is coming. God gives a nation over, but at the end time, he comes and he brings an undiluted wrath that will be like nothing we have ever seen, heard, or known. And so I don't care what your government tells you about sin. I care what God does. And if you're here today and the government is what dictates your morality, that's not going to do it. God has spoken, and I want you to hear this, No president will be present when you stand before God on the last day. There will be no president. It'll be you and God and the truth. And God has revealed this truth in his word. So we don't change sin and redefine God's word and say what's in or what's out. If you've come here this morning and you're living in that lie, it's going to end when you stand before God on the last day. And all these shaking your rah-rahs and giving a new definition to sin and what's right and wrong will be over. So my heart this morning is that you would hear this before you die and stand before God. God sent his son into the world and put him up on a cross to bear the wrath that we deserve for all of our sins. Took it so that your sins could be washed away as we sang and separate as far as the east is from the west. Don't redefine sin. Repent. Come to Jesus for salvation from your sin. So my conclusion is the wicked flee when no one is chasing, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And because we're right, righteous in Christ before God, I want you to be as bold as a lion in these days. Nothing can hurt you. I sat there with my poor boy thinking I'm dying right now and just saying, Josh, you stand on that gospel. If you die right now, that gospel will bring you safely to Jesus Christ. Be as bold as a lion in what's coming and what's going to come after us. Stand in the gospel. Get firm in your faith. May we not back away from hoping in the gospel and giving our lives to share the greatest message that there's ever been. Let's unify, loving even our enemies with a gracious, forbearing spirit that speaks the truth in love into every situation. 
for one reason and one reason only, the glory of Almighty God. See you in November. Father, I pray, let us be a light during these days. God, let us be about the gospel. Let us be so faithful to enter into such a broken world that's under judgment and decaying quicker and quicker, and the message is sweeter and sweeter. Let us not get our pajamas on and get on the rooftops. God, help us to enter into this world like Jesus and love it, to love it and bring truth and light into it. God, they're dying. They need this gospel. Let us not smile and say, oh, it's neat that you you can pick whatever sex you want to be or whoever you want to love. God, help us to stand in the truth and say, come to Christ and he'll reorient all your love's desires. He'll, He'll change everything about you. But you can't stand under this and smile and redefine and think you're okay on judgment day. God, help us to love enough to stand in and preach and declare and show these truths and let us have families, relationships that show this world the glory and beauty of your design so that they say, what's the hope within you? Oh God, help us to hold to the gospel of Jesus Christ together and care and help each other in these hard days and that we would make it to the end and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.